You're not going to negotiate on the sunglasses, no? Mm -hmm. Okay. Ready when you are. Yeah, I know, I'm sorry. No, sorry, the Trump pants thing is now just coming. To shop completely. I don't know how bad I'm today. I'm Greek, you see, so I have dark circles. There's not very much I can do about it. I'm like a meth addict if I don't have proper TV makeup done. So, we shall see. I can't see them if it's yeah. semi-air. I don't trust you as far as I can fucking throw you. Trust the camera, don't, man. Don't worry about... No, no, I don't trust any of you. <laughs> BBC, give me a break. Okay. <laughs> okay. Go ahead. Thank you. You at speed? Yes, I am at speed. Milo, just give me some voice level, would you, first of all? Please? My name is Milo Yiannopoulos. I'm senior editor for Breitbart News. I'm here at UC Irvine. That's lovely. Thank yeah, you very we're much. We're happy. Working with professionals. Um, <laughs> Milo, can you, can you just tell me, first of all, what, is, what, what, in your view, is behind the support for Donald Trump in this election? What is driving support for Mr. Trump, principally? Well, it's a number of things. First of all, uh, nobody's really talked about the one thing American voters care about the most, which is immigration. Uh, he was the first one to open that discussion up. He's the only person with, any, with a good position on it. Second of all is trade, globalism, globalization, um, sort of unaccountable bureaucratic elites that people have finally worked out actually don't run things very well, whether it's the Olympics, the EU, the UN, or anything else. And third, particularly that animates my supporters, uh, is political correctness and free speech. We talk about free speech in very abstract, loose terms in Europe. Uh, nobody really cares about it that much because we don't really have it. Uh, in America, they do care about it. The First Amendment is extremely important. Actually, it's the fundamental underpinning of American civilization. Uh, and it is under pretty grave threat in America, like I don't think it has been before. So those three things, I think, are what are, what are getting people out to the polls for Trump. Under threat in what way? Well, there are all sorts of um, risks to free speech in America, whether they're coming from the progressive left, feminism, Black Lives Matter, on college campuses, the safe space and trigger warning culture. There's a sense in the media in America also that um, the range of acceptable thoughts uh, and opinions, that you, they're the ones that you can uh, safely express without risking your newspaper column or risking your career. That's becoming narrower and narrower all the time and also being shoved quite far to the left. So irrespective of your political positions, my view is that you should want your adversaries to be able to, to uh, state their arguments in the strongest possible terms. And you should want, if you are confident that you're right and that your facts are right um, and that your way is the best way, you should believe um, in an open free marketplace of ideas. Many people in America believe that that is not what, what you have here anymore. But there's a difference, isn't there, between being offended and disagreeing with someone's facts or their, their interpretation of something. So, for example, you said today that uh, Muslims hate everyone. All Muslims hate everyone was your, was your position. Now, maybe you were joking, maybe you weren't. But well, you know I was. You, well, well, sure, fine, fair enough. You should ask me a question that's not a deliberate uh, misrepresentation okay, of what well, I said in my speech, because you're perfectly well aware well, from the context and the rhetoric of the speech that I was talking about different minority groups. So if you want to ask me a question about stuff like that, you should ask me a question that, that it, is less disingenuous. Okay, you said Muslims like gang rape. Well, I said I br they were going to bring their delicacies with them of pork chops, yogurt, and gang rape. I think you said lamb, if you're not, to be fair. Actually, it might be lamb chops. Of course, it would be lamb chops. Um, if you're uh, not prepared to read the comedy into that statement and you think that that is a literal expression, then I can't help you. No, but that's my point. That's what I'm asking you about. Are you concerned that people are, are becoming confused between what is comedy and what is serious political comment and that they can't listen to any of it because they just take offence? No, I think you'd have to be so stupid um, to mistake my comedy routines and stand-up. Uh, you know, or you, you, I don't believe that anybody is so dumb that they can't tell the difference between a piece of political analysis and a joke. Um, if you're one of those people, there's really no hope for you, and I don't care. Um, what I do want, however, is to desensitize people to this uh, offense-taking grievance and victimhood culture. And if the way to do that, if the way to respond to outrage culture is to be outrageous, which it seems to be, it seems to be working, by the way, I'm, I'm winning on college campuses for sure, um, then, then so much the better. I simply don't uh, take the charge seriously that people can't tell the difference between jokes and, and, and fact. What is the old right? The alt-right is a new movement. It's full of energy and enthusiasm and excitement, and it is primarily concerned with the three things that I think people are, are, is uh, the three things that I think are energizing Trump voters: immigration, trade, and political correctness, and, and free speech generally. It takes a number of different forms. I mean, you can define it very, very broadly to include sort of classical liberals, disaffected leftists. Um, ordinary conservatives, and this new, young, very uh, 
very energized, kind of trolly, mischievous, youthful contingent that has suddenly become interested in politics again. That's the bit, that's the wing that I'm sort of most closely associated with. And that's the most exciting bit because it's the bit that had checked out politics almost for generations, really. Donald Trump's re energized those people. And he's re energized those people by standing up to the nannies, the cultural scolds, the bullies, the feminists, you know, the people who don't want you to say things, don't want you to go there, the people who perpetually take, you know, lines from speeches out of context in an attempt to sort of whatever. Um, you know, the people who, uh, you know, who are always talking about offense taking and nobody really cares. Um, and that's the bit of the movement I really like. And that's the bit of movement that is sort of unstoppable, really. And irrespective of what happens in selections, that's the bit of the movement that will win. So let me ask you in your own words, because you, you know, accuse people of putting words into your mouth or taking things out of context or not recognizing humor when it's there. <laughs> what is your view on Islam? Uh, as a gay man, I'm very comfortable with Donald Trump's um, statements, although he made a few different statements with varying degrees of, of firmness on this subject. I'd be very comfortable with a, a halt on Muslim immigration. I'd be very, I would wish that had happened in London. Um, it isn't radical Islam, it's Islam that is the problem. Um, that is my view. Um, I don't particularly like the way that uh, European cities are changing. I think Germany is a, you know, is a horror show. I think London has changed dramatically in the last 10 years. And what happens in America matters for everybody else. What happens in America matters most, and I don't want America to go the same way. Do you consider yourself a white national? List? No. Isn't that what some people would think of when they hear of you don't like the changing face of places like No, London, I'm talking about culture, like, not like race. Muslims coming in. No, sure. I'm talking about culture, not race, and it's typical of someone like the BBC to try to conflate the two because I'm what they want to do well, what they want to do is to suggest that if you're proud of your country and the ideals on which your country is founded, that that somehow makes you a racist. It doesn't. I'm not talking about skin color. I don't care about skin color. All my boyfriends are black. I don't give a toss about skin color. Um, what I do care about is values and ideas. And the regressive social attitudes of Muslims in the West are terrifying, absolutely terrifying. And organizations like yours won't report on them on honestly, accurately, or fairly. Uh, it's Left, is left to other places to do it. Um, and then what you do is, you know, once you fail to report on them accurately, is accuse people who are concerned with some justification about the changing nature of their culture, not race, uh, in their countries, is you then accuse them of being white nationalists. That's pretty disgusting. Let me be clear, I'm not accusing you of anything. I'm just well, asking. I'm, white nationalists. It's, one of those it's a question, sort of not an accusation. Would you ask anyone that? Would you just sure, go I randomly ask anyone? Hi, it's madam, I've never met you before. Sure. Are you a white nationalist? No, you don't do that. Well, um, you're doing it because you want to suggest that there is something nefarious about my a belief system. You're doing it because you want to associate my uh, admiration for American ideals, my admiration for what happens in, you know, in America and saying that matters everywhere else, freedom, democracy, property, capital. You want to sort of associate that with race. I never did that. You did that. And then ask me whether I'm a white supremacist, asking if I think white people are better than others. I no said idea. nationalist rather than supremacist. And you can, no more, you can no more read my mind than I can read yours. Let me ask you what you think about well, you feminism. Can read it. you can read it enough to accuse me of it or to ask me uh, whether I'm a white supremacist. It's absolutely absurd. Uh, I think it drives the sexes apart. Um, I think, by the way, women agree with me. Um, fewer than one in five women in America describe themselves as feminists. And the number in England is just 7%, because feminists on the one hand say, oh, it's all just about equality, but what they do is quite different. And when women see the nasty, lesbianic, misandrist, hateful feminist movement, um, they run a mile from it. And everybody's running from it. The only people who are still feminists are journalists. Are you in favor of gender equality? Of course, any, any sensible person is. But What's I'm not the difference between that and feminism, in, in your view? Well, feminism preaches gender equality, but it practices misandry. Um, it practices man-hating and it spreads cons conspiracy theories and lies. If you tell a woman that everything that's wrong in her life, everything that's ever happened to her that's bad, all of the awful things are the fault of some man somewhere or some mythical, mystical conspiracy theory force called the patriarchy, you're robbing that woman of the ability to better herself. You're robbing her of the ability to take control of her own life, to pass the exam she didn't pass, instead of saying, oh, the marking criteria is sexist. You know, to, to, really, to take control and to be something. That feminism these days preaches, it describes itself one way, but acts totally differently, and women agree with me. They've all seen it. Isn't there a parallel between talking about the, the patriarchy and the way that you've just described it there and some people talking about the establishment as a kind of all evil all disastrous kind of concept. Yeah, it's a fair point. Um, certainly, uh, I think that uh, I think though that on the one hand, you know, patriarchy is a conspiracy theory dreamed up in social science departments and universities. The establishment is a very, very well understood uh, nexus of government, big business, and pol uh, you know, and, and various other organs of civil and, and, and national society. Um, I don't think anybody really denies that there is a revolving door between, let's say, government and big business. That you know, different bits of this uh, this this thing kind of support each other, the way academia supports the media, supports the entertainment industry. When people talk about the establishment as a sort of scary, um, uh, looming presence, I think they're right. When they talk about the patriarchy, I think it's a conspiracy theory.
I know you have to go. I'd like to ask you one more question, if I may. You're going to call me a sexist or if, racist? If, so if what, I, I, what, are you, what are you going to ask me now? Simply asking you questions. And this last question is, what do you think will happen in the United States if Donald Trump loses this election to the, um, this movement that has is, that is, uh, been energized by his candidacy? We're constantly told by the media that this will die with Trump. Um, couldn't be less true. Um, one, of the reasons, one of the ways you know that is it started a long time before Trump showed up. He had Trump capitalized on it. He didn't invent it. Um, and this, this large slice of the American population, which could be anywhere between 20 and 50 percent, who don't like globalism, who don't like political correctness, who do want stronger borders, who aren't happy with the trade arrangements, who, who are fans of various bits of the Trump agenda, um, those people are not going anywhere. In fact, with Hillary Clinton in the White House, they're going to be hugely energized. Um, they're going to be angry. They're going to be louder than ever. And they're going to start winning converts from her side who get dis disillusioned with her. I would say probably 30% of the audience um, everywhere I go is what I would call disaffected liberals. People who don't like their own side, who wonder how their own side went so crazy. Um, and who will come, come up to me you know, afterwards and say, you know what, I don't really agree with you on anything, but it was very important for me to be here. Those are the people that are going to start voting Republican next time around. Um, and it is going to probably, you know, I mean, who knows, right? But there is no way that just, with, just because Trump wins or doesn't win, either way, that this movement, this huge nationalist populist uprising against the nannies, against the globalists, against all of the, you know, massed ranks of the, of the global elites, there's no way it's going anywhere, irrespective of what happens in the election. <laughs>